But each one of you have sometimes had deep meditations and how wonderful it feels and how peaceful, how inspired you are. Now multiply that by a thousand and imagine what it must have been like coming out and seeing the truth of all things, not even needing to read it from a book or listen to it from a, a great nun or a great monk, but right there, right in front. And something from which once it's seen, all the Dhamma, the thousands and thousands of teachings, all just um, unfolding from that seed of truth which the Buddha penetrated under the Bodhi tree. And after that, he didn't just disappear, but after that he spent 45 years teaching, teaching the Dhamma. And at this point I will pause because many of you may know that as a monk, as a bhikkhu, I'm now 45 years since my ordination. So 45 years seems to be the time <laughs> when people disappear. And you say, no, Venerable Chanda, oh, do you mean I have to keep carrying on teaching? <laughs> but no, no, I'm in good health and happy, so I'm not going to go anywhere, especially during COVID time. They can't let me go overseas. They can't let me go into a coffin. They can't let me go anywhere. But anyhow, for 45 years, the Buddha taught. And of course, one of the great things which he taught in those 45 years was the establishing of the fourfold community. Not the threefold community of just monks, laymen, and laywomen, but the fourfold community of the bhikkhuni sangha, heaps of them, enlightened bhikkhunis roaming the earth, enlightened monks roaming the earth, laymen, laywomen in white or whatever, and just practicing the Dharma diligently. That's what he taught. That's what his mission was. And anyone who's got sort of, uh, hasn't got any blinkers on their eyes, you read the suttas, you find out that's what the Buddha intended. And only when that was completed, only then, only then did the Buddha pass away. He knew that the Dhamma and its manifestation in humanity was this great community of Buddhists, monastic and lay, male and female, were there ready to take the Dhamma forward in this world. And of course, it's lasted for so many centuries now. And in fact, when I know some people sometimes tell me, oh, this is the, the declining age of the Dhamma. I think, where on earth do you get that from? Because you see that there's a monasticism, lay practice, the whole thing is growing. At least that's how I feel. I get so many invitations everywhere. Now, some I can't do, obviously, because of travel restrictions, but try and do your very best. And everybody else is very busy. It's amazing just how much interest, how much power there is in meditation these days. Even recently, I saw an article uh, in the, um, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation's um, internet service that... Um, I think his name is Chris Hemsworth or something, Thor. Thor, the fellow who's the superhero with the hammer uh, in the, the movies. He's been teaching meditation. And I thought, wow, I wonder what type of meditation he teaches. He certainly has to put his hammer away when he's sitting down quietly. But nevertheless, and I don't want to argue with him if he does the right type of meditation or the wrong type of meditation. There's certain people I would never argue with especially if they're much bigger than me. <laughs> but nevertheless, it seems how powerful, how common this actually is in today's world. Where did it all come from? It came from that time when the Buddha was under the Bodhi tree. And it's getting so peaceful, not through talking, not through thinking, but by being still. And it's that stillness when things just, they stay there and they don't work. That is the Dharma of Venerable Chanda's computer earlier on. It was still, <laughs> a computer was meditating in jhana or something. That's why it wouldn't work until it really had to. And then it sort of behaved and came back to life again. But nevertheless, still, that stillness is something which is so powerful in this world. We always do things, walk around, 
manage things, but when we have these opportunities, just to sit down and disappear and just be calm. And that energizes our mind. Now that's one of the things when people talk about mindfulness these days. There's so many different levels of mindfulness. Everybody is sort of mindful. Even a drunk coming out of the pub before COVID closed down the pubs, they would have some degree of mindfulness and manage to somehow get home. But that's only the least, the, the dullest form of mindfulness. They have some awareness, but not very much. And the normal human being have much more mindfulness. Just they know where to catch the bus, where to get the food. But when you meditate, your mindfulness just really gets strong. And I had to give it a name, and the only name I could think of was like superpower mindfulness. That's what it feels like. Your awareness is just so powerful and so strong. Whatever you see, you see much deeper into it. But it's not just seeing deeper into things. It's also whatever you see is more beautiful. It's more attractive. The colors are just enhanced. What that really does, it just shows you the energy of your mind. And that is a good sign that your meditation is really beginning to take off. It's a sign that the five hindrances are being weakened, which is exactly what the Buddha did. Weaken those five hindrances so much. His mind was really clear, powerful, awake. And you know the word for being awake is? The word for being awake is Bujati. And one who's been awakened is Buddha. That's where the word comes from. It's a beautiful uh, concept that when the mind is empowered, it can see so much more. And I, so this is just what happens when you spend a long time doing deep meditation. You come out afterwards, you're happy, you're enjoying whatever you're seeing, and what you're seeing, you can penetrate deeper into it. One of the points which I often make in the, the practice of Dhamma is just naturally a very joyful tradition. Some of the happiest people I ever met were these senior teaching monks. Not all the monks were very happy, some were really miserable, and those are the ones I didn't want to stay with. But someone like an Ajahn Chah, wow, he could really inspire you just with his smile. And that type of inspiration meant that this was coming not from theory, this was real. And when you saw the reality of what mindfulness actually does to you, what the practice of stillness does to enhance the clarity of your mind and the power of the mind, wow, that gets really, really attractive. And it's not just intellectuals. This is just emotional wisdom, that emotional sensitivity to understand just how your mind works. And as a byproduct, I say as a byproduct, so for many people, this is really important. When the mind becomes empowered, your body becomes healthy and it becomes strong. Strange thing that with a healthy body, it often comes from a very peaceful, positive mind. So you actually really are helping your health of body, your longevity, and just your general fitness, just by sitting down and doing nothing. I really do mean doing nothing instead of thinking. So there was the Buddha under the Bodhi tree, so peaceful, so still, emerging from his deep meditation and just seeing just the, what the cause of this reincarnation in samsara is. The round of rebirth. Why? Because you cannot stop samsara with willpower. You have to see it with the wisdom power. And that's the whole point of our practice. We think it's so still in meditation that we begin to see things. And of course, oh, one of the things which you see is just you know this wanting and wanting to control things the experience in this time with covid is very fascinating because you can see how so many people lose control 
during this time because they're stuck in their houses. They can't go here, they can't go there. Their empire, where they exert control, where they can go shopping, where they can go to the pub, where they can go to watch the football or whatever, is really restricted. For a monastic, it's wonderful. Yeah, restrict me some more. I don't want to go out from my cave where I meditate. I like being inside. But it's teaching you great dhammas, great, great lessons of the more you want, the more you have to suffer. It's what the Buddha called the separation from where you are to where you want to be. You know, one thing you find after many years of practice, where you are and where you want to be, where you are is actually not that bad. Why do you want to be anywhere else? In fact, if you let go of this wanting, let go of all this thinking that tomorrow will be better, the next place will be more attractive, the next experience will be happier. If you let go of all of that, then you start to appreciate where you already are. The mind opens up and wakens up to the beauty of now. And it does become beautiful. That's what it looks like. And then you can close your eyes and the beauty of the mind, the beauty of the present moment, the beauty of silence. Now, you may not believe me, but you know, I think many of you know that you know, I don't tell lies. I'm truthful as I possibly can be. Now, when I'm speaking, I'm not thinking at all. Just the words are just coming out. And I love teaching like this, because sometimes I say, you know, who gave that talk? It wasn't me. You know, just words just come out as you describe. Just, you know, the, the nature of this practice and the nature of life and the nature of the mind and the nature of nothing, of things disappearing and vanishing. It's a beautiful thing to be able to, to express. And so you express it with this great sense of, of joy and happiness and inspiration. So as we just do disappear, because we don't want anything, we appreciate what we already have and how satisfying it is. Come so peaceful, so still. And it's like being a Buddha. It's like, I, I think in the meditation I'm going to do in a, in a few minutes, I did this uh, for our way second uh, in Western Australia. I can think I'm going to do it again. It's just this Buddha Anusati, just the reflection of what it must have felt like under the Bodhi tree after the Buddha was enlightened, when he opened his eyes. What that experience must have been like, as far as you can um, imagine. And the experience is one of having nothing left to do. Many of you, when you finish work and you go home, feel, ah, now I can rest. You got work to do and food to prepare. Then you go on like a retreat or holiday when somebody else prepares all the, the food for you. You just sit there. But you're still thinking about plans and worries. But imagine all that is finished. There's nothing left to achieve. There's nothing missing in your life. And you know that that's always going to be like that from now on. There's nothing you need to do. There's no way you need to go. There's nothing missing in your life, now or ever. You've done the job. Finished is the task. You can put everything down and really relax. Really let go. And enjoy this moment because there's nothing more to improve in your life. I see that most people are always into improving themselves. Improving their meditation, improving their knowledge, improving their house, improving their relationships. This is doing something in the opposite direction. Instead of improving, stopping. Appreciating where you already are. Stopping doing things. Stopping thinking about things. Stopping planning things. And just letting it happen, this moment. And you find yourself go deeper and deeper and deeper into this moment, deeper into your body, 
deeper into this present moment, deeper into the silence, deeper into the mind, always going in, 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 in. You know, sometimes that people say, oh, Ajahn Brahm only teaches Samatha meditation, always teaching nimittas and jhanas, but no. But as you go in, you're seeing in. To me, that is insight meditation. <laughs> seeing inside, seeing how things work. And of course, you understand what happens. You get this great uh, wisdom um, pieces you know, from your meditation. And that means that you understand just what it must have been like for the Buddha, having got that peace, that stillness. And then his old friend, his old friend from his former life when the Buddha, according to the suttas, was a monk under the previous Buddha, Kasapa, Jyotipara. And under the Buddha, Kasapa, he also had of many other fellow monk friends, one of which was Sahampati. What we hear is Brahma Sahampati. He wasn't a Brahma realm or a god, he was for an anagami from the realm of the non-returners. And this is what it says in the suttas. He came down after the Buddha's enlightenment to congratulate his friend. So we were monks together in a former life. I became a a non-returner. You got reborn here, and now you're enlightened. You're a Buddha. Please go and teach. Put forth that effort, that that um, work, to go and teach for the benefit of all sentient beings. And as Venerable Chanda would know very well, teaching is a great pain in the butt. Actually, it's more a pain in the, the mouth than in the butt. But you do that for the sake of all other beings as your act of gratitude to your teacher. For me, that teacher, Ajahn Chah, he's passed away, but still I've got so many debts to him. And the great teacher would be the Buddha himself. And of so much respect for him penetrating the Dhamma and also doing all that 45 years of hard work of teaching. But of course, when his teaching career ended, when he passed away, he didn't pass away just uh, leaving more stuff to be done. He'd given this, this, you might call it the virus of liberation, which is incredibly contagious. And no one can wipe that out from the face of this earth. People teaching, showing by example, infecting other people with the Dhamma. And that is such an amazing teaching. And it's lasted all this time and it will still continue to last a long time later. We all take our, our turn in pushing that Dhamma wheel further to extend these teachings, to inspire, to lead. And of course, at waste that time, the main thing is to inspire ourselves and inspire others. Inspiration is a great source of mental energy. Desperation <laughs> is the opposite, which makes people think, oh, it's a really terrible world. But when you think about something like waste that day, I don't mean think about it and just start all sorts of ideas and concepts, but put that idea in your mind and let your mind play with it, not with thoughts, but with emotions of inspiration, of peace, of joy, of gratitude of all this wonderful sense you want to give, you know, to, this, to the um, Buddhism. In each way which you can, as much as you can. And that sometimes, that's what you feel. You may be tired, but it doesn't matter. You want to give some more. You may be exhausted. Ah, let's give some more. Because of great gratitude. You don't work according to rationality or logic or what other people think. There's something else which motivates you and makes you talk and, and arrange and teach and get these internet things going. You do that, why? Because of this faith in the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. Because it's inspiration. You've got so much out of it yourself, you just want to give, to share with others. And little by little, 
one practices and it's just a matter of time. I know many people are really worried and say, oh, I haven't got the jhana yet. Oh, I haven't got stream winning yet. I haven't got this yet. I haven't got this. Oh, come on. Be patient. Don't want anything. Just see what is left when all that wanting has vanished. When all those goals of wanting things, you don't know really what they are. When you stop wanting those things and let go, all those things, they just come to you. Weird, but so true. When you experience those things, you just sit there doing nothing, no expectations, just relaxing, just being peaceful, not thinking about anything, not planning anything, not worrying about anything. You just sit there and wow, wham, bam. All these incredible things, they just arrive. And you know that, you didn't do it. No more than I gave this talk, just the words come out of your mouth. No more that I meditate, just I sit there and disappear. That's all that happens. And when you can do that totally, 100%, then all those incredible things which you read about in the books, all those things you, you work so hard for and aspired for, all going in the wrong direction, they will come to you, already inside. You just open out to them and enjoy the incredible peace fulfillment and purity of the Dhamma. I know certainly when I was a spiritual seeker, that you know, before I was a, a monk, you know, you're always looking for authenticity. Many people said they knew the truth, you'd look to them and check them out and there, no way. There's something about the, the Dhamma, you can feel it, you can taste it, you can realize it. And that gives it this incredible sense of, sense of truth reality, perfection. People ask, how can you talk about perfection in the world like it is? <laughs> Go and look in the forest, my old forest simile. Every forest I've been to in the world, not one forest has perfect trees. It's very rare even to see one perfect tree. All the trees in the forest are bent and crooked and twisted and damaged. Every tree is damaged. Scars, breaks, bent. But the more damaged the tree is, the more beautiful it is. The more bent and twisted and gnarled, the more attractive it is. And that taught me a huge lesson. Instead of looking for perfection, looking for acceptance, embracing, love, kindness. And that's the path of the Dhamma. Not improving, but embracing, letting go, and being still, and being really, really peaceful. So I've got half uh, uh, my eye on the clock. And according to uh, what I'm supposed to do, I'm supposed to do a guided meditation now. Is that a good idea? Very good, the thumbs up. So, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you're sitting down on the chair. I, no, honestly, I don't really mind even if you're sitting on the toilet seat. Because as long as your mind is respectful, the body it just does what it needs to do. And so if you're laying on the bed or on the grass somewhere, wherever you are, just get your body really comfortable. And I'm going to do the special Buddha Nusati different way than you may be used to the um, uh, awareness of the Buddha by imagining as much as you can what it must be like to be the Buddha. Just the same way when I remember at primary school in Acton when I was a kid, the teacher said, stand up, put your hands out and think you're a tree in the forest swaying in the wind. I remember that, and it was really good. And you could feel a little bit like, like a tree. But now, instead of being a tree, being a Buddha. That's so cool. So if you'd like to close your eyes. I'm going to close my eyes too, so I'm not sure what's going on on the machine. Close your eyes. Just breathe in a few breaths to make yourself comfortable. 
I mean, a few deep breaths. Now keep on breathing, obviously. And then just check your body sitting here. Make sure your legs, your butt, your back, your hands, and even your head is comfortable. It's not going to be a long meditation, maybe 25 minutes, but hopefully you're comfortable enough to be able to let the body rest and relax. And as the body is resting, just go into your mind. Those who have listened to me teach meditation before, the peaceometer, which tells you just how quiet your mind is or how agitated, just like a thermometer or a speedometer. So from a reading from one being really peaceful to 10, how peaceful is your mind right now? Give it a number. If it's really agitated, take some time understanding why and how to calm the mind down. How just to be in this moment because all the problems and all the busyness, all the difficulties from the past, they don't live in the present moment. They live in two different countries, the country of the past and the country of the future. You're in another place, this beautiful island called the present moment. and all of the inner commentary. You don't need to take notes of what's happening. The really good stuff you will remember automatically. Nor do you need to give it descriptions. Because if you're talking inside, you're not listening to the Dhamma. So now, when you're ready, remember this is our ceremony to recollect Waisak. Part of which is the enlightenment of the Buddha. Use your powers of imagination. Almost like a role play. Imagine what it must have felt like. sitting under this huge tree, the Bodhi tree, the original one, sitting on a cushion made of grass or leaves, comfortable, having been fed a delicious meal by Sujata, it's a meal which was meant for a, a, a deity. hunger satisfied, shaded under a tree. In what would have been at that time a very quiet, secluded park next to the river Nirangela, which in those days would not be dry, be running, running with the water coming down from the Himalaya mountains. You're sitting there under that tree. You have just in the morning of Waisak, you've enlightened, done the task, the job is finished. There's nothing more to do. You really are 
free from all the burdens of trying to achieve something. There's nothing more you can add to what you've seen. Your enlightenment is perfect. There's no place left for craving, for wanting, there's nothing more to want. You have the bliss, the contentment, full enlightenment right in front of you, right inside of you. Beautiful loving kindness for all, which is just natural, it doesn't need to be developed. It has been developed. There's nothing to hold on to. Everything is finished. No one can take anything away from you. There's nothing left. You're free. Your peace, your contentment. It's real, doesn't need to be protected. It's always going to be there. As long as his body is there. All the striving which we do in life, there's no need for striving anymore. Striving has reached its goal, its destination. There's no other destination. So now you do sit down, relax. You're retired, really retired. You don't need to think about what to do, food. There's nothing left to do. There's peace. Peace to the east, this west and north and south, up and down, all around you and inside you. Nothing needs to be improved or fixed. Your job is complete. You really can relax and let go and be still. There's no place left for wanting. Wanting makes no sense to you anymore. Just be here. No place left for ill will. Just, this is samsara. We're at ease, we're free. We carry no burdens in our mind. All of those have been let go of. Nothing is left. So we're free, free like a bird in the sky, soaring on the spring winds, carrying no weight, no burden. It's a time of rest, rest which is not going to disappear, peace. All those things which you aspired for, all done. The work is finished. Really finished. I know we, we say work is finished, we have to go back to work the next day or the next week or when we get called for another job. So this work is really finished. Once and for all. The work of peace, of insight, of understanding. Incomplete. How do you feel? Just imagining what it must be like. There's a sense there. You do not need to do anything. It's peace. Not a peace which is temporary. 
not a peace which will go when you have to go back to your family or your housework or whatever you do. This is real peace. The peace of having achieved everything which had to be achieved. You finished the complete tasks have all been done will never need to be done by you again you can feel that when the mind doesn't reach out for anything stays here and goes inside it's like what we call or what the buddha said a taste of freedom, the muti rasa, a taste of enlightenment, the joy of enlightenment, sambodhi sukha. What does that feel like? You imagine this, and soon you get so quiet. You can't even think. Just like when you're listening to, when I was a lay person, listen to great music. I couldn't say anything or think. I was so satisfied and fulfilled with the peace, tranquility, the inner satisfaction, not needing anything in the whole universe. Feel like you're just the Buddha sitting under the Bodhi tree. Not moving because there's nothing to move towards. Not anything to move away from. Your peace is not a reaction to the world. It's what happens when you stop reacting and you disappear. You notice it's the wanting and the ill will which lets you make you makes your sense of self. You don't want anything in the whole world. You're not trying to run away from anything. You dissolve. You evaporate. A sense of self cannot be found. To be, you have to want. And you stop wanting. You're not there. task has been complete. All that's left is peace, stillness, contentment. Stillness gets deeper and deeper. And the contentment more delicious, more satisfying. And the happiness, the happiness of peace, the most delicious form of happiness. You sit here. Experience what it must be like to be the Buddha under the Bodhi tree. the first face act. Nothing to do. Nowhere to go. 
This is what, this is what peace feels like. You don't give it a babe. When you try and describe things, it creates busyness for our mind. You don't need to give it a name. You feel it. You feel it so much more directly. It's like a wind blows past. Put a sat out in the open. We're probably inside. Imagine a wind passing by your face. You don't ever know where the wind comes from. You never know where it goes to. You only experience it in this moment as it passes by your face. All life is like this. Everything stops. In peace, movement vanishes. What you're experiencing is too powerful to give a name to. Just experience and know like the wind that passes, a small wind comes, but you don't move. Your peace, your stillness. It doesn't attach to things. Born of letting go. Born of being free. All that struggle. Struggle of beings in samsara. Trying to achieve. Get some safety, security, happiness, whatever. Trying to get praise from others. Relying on others to tell you what to do. Now you don't rely on others, you don't rely on yourself. You're enlightened, there's nothing to do. There's no wanting. No yearning. That is all finished. You're at peace. Just like the Buddha. Under the Bodhi tree. The Bodh Gaya. In India. The first race I The distance between you now and then is not that far. The more peaceful you are, the closer you are. Don't think, don't give things names. Enjoy. Taste the peace as fully as you can. Savor it.
with us. As always, comes a time when we come out of that stillness, even though I'm sure you don't want to, I don't want to. Come out back into your room, to your body, into what people call today. But before you open your eyes, just to know how was that? How peaceful, how beautiful was it? And how relaxed is your body? How at ease the aches and pains of a physical human body and the mind has touched some peace. Now I invite you to open your eyes. And smile as you come back into this world. Ah. Now I enjoy doing that. I only do it usually on Van Waysack type. Keep it as a special meditation for a special occasion. So there we go. Now Everybody, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope it was nice and uh, a taste of what Waysack is really all about. And also, um, I now hand over to uh, Ben Wajanda. Please take over. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's in the evening for me. I'll be coming back later on, but now I have, oh my, <laughs> the duties to do. It's 6 p.m. now over in Western Australia, and it's the time for me to go uh, answer telephones, talk to monks, blah, 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 blah. But it's my job. And I just give myself wholeheartedly to what needs to be done. Sadly, sadly, sadly. Thank you so okay. much. Man. Of course, okay. I was joking because I didn't want to come out of the meditation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, you look much, much happier. Yes, yes. That, yeah, very good. Computers Excellent. and meditation are at two different ends of the spectrum. Yep. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to go out now and I'll okay. join again later on this uh, evening for me, but uh, in the, the afternoon for you. Afternoon for us, yes. Thank you very yeah, much, Ajahn. And uh, we'll okay, welcome bye. you back at about, um, it'll be quarter to two our time. But yeah, basically. Yes. Um, yeah, that time. You know when to so, right. Yeah. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> See ya. Bye, Ajahn. Very good. So, I don't know about you, but I don't feel like saying anything now. <laughs> but this is officially the time for any um, Dhamma discussion that we may want to have. Uh, you can really take your time about it. Um, and I think most of you know me. I'm Venerable Chanda. I was ordained um, in Burma 